rifle. And by the time you have got him in line, you need a, ri a rifled cannon. And by the time you have drawn a bead on him, you see well enough that nothing but an unusually long-winded streak of lightning could re reach him where he is now. But if you start a swift-footed dog after him, you will enjoy it ever so much, especially if it is a dog that has a good opinion of himself and has been brought up to think he knows something about speed. The coyote will go swinging gently off on that deceitful trot of his, and every little while he will smile a fraudful smile over his shoulders, shoulder. It will fill that dog entirely full of encouragement and worldly ambition and make him lay his head still lower to the ground and stretch his neck further to the front and pant more fiercely and stick his tail out straighter behind and move his furious legs with a yet wilder frenzy and leave a broader and broader and higher and denser cloud of desert and smoking behind and marking his long wake across the level plain. And all this time the dog is only a short 20 feet behind the coyote. And to save the soul of him, he cannot understand why it is that he cannot get perceptibly closer. And he begins to get aggravated, and it makes him madder and madder to see how gently the coyote glides along and never pants or sweats or ceases to smile. And he grows still more and more incensed to see how shamefully he has been taken in by an entire stranger and what an ignoble swindle that long, calm, soft-footed trot is. And next he noticed that he is getting fagged, and that the coyote actually has to slacken speed a little to keep from running away from him. And then that town dog is mad and earnest, and he begins to strain and weep and swear and paw the sand higher than ever, and reach for the coyote with concentrated and desperate energy. This spurt finds him six feet behind the gliding enemy and two miles from his friends. And then in the instant that a wild new hope is lighting up his face, the coyote turns and smiles blandly upon him once more and with a something about it which seems to say, well, I shall have to tear myself away from you, bub. Business is business and it will not do for me to be fooling along this way all day. And forthwith there is a rushing sound and the sudden splitting of a long crack through the atmosphere. And behold, that dog is solitary and alone in the midst of a vast solitude. It makes his head swim. He stops and looks all around, climbs the nearest sand mound and gazes into the distance, shakes his head reflectively and then without a word he turns and jogs along back to his train and takes up a humble position under the hindmost wagon and feels unspeakably mean and looks ashamed, and hangs his tail at half-mast for a week. And for as much as a year after that, whenever there is a great hue and cry after a coyote, that dog will merely glance in that direction without emotion, and apparently observe to himself, I believe I do not wish any of the pie. The coyote lives chiefly in the most desolate and forbidding deserts along with the lizard, the jackass rabbit, and the raven, and gets an uncertain and precarious living and earns it. He seems to subsist almost wholly on the carcasses of oxen, mules, and horses that have dropped out of immigrant trains and died, and upon windfalls of carrion, and occasional legacies of offal bequeathed to him by white men who have been opulent enough to have something better to butcher than condemned army bacon. He will eat anything in the world that his first cousins, the desert frequenting tribes of Indians will, and they will eat anything they can bite. It is a curious fact that these la latter are the only creatures known to history who will eat nitroglycerin and ask for more if they survive. The coyote of the deserts beyond the Rocky Mountains has a peculiarly hard time of it owing to the fact that his relations, the Indians, are just as apt to be the first to detect his seductive scent on the desert breeze and follow the fragrance to the late oxen it emanated from, as he is himself. And when this occurs, he has to content himself with sitting off at a long, little distance, watching those people strip, strip off and dig out everything edible and walk off with it. Then he and the waiting ravens explore the skeleton and polish the bones. 
It is considered considered that the coyote and the obscene bird and the Indian of the desert testify their blood kinship with each other and that they live together in the waste parts of the earth on terms of perfect confidence and friendship while hating all other creatures and yearning to assist at their funerals. He does not mind going a hundred miles to breakfast and a hundred and fifty to dinner because he is sure to have three or four days between meals and he can just as well be traveling and looking at the scenery as lying around doing nothing and adding to the burdens of his parents. We soon, we soon learn to recognize the sharp, vicious bark of the coyote as it came across the murky plain at night to disturb our dreams among the mail sacks. And remembering his forlorn aspect and his hard fortune, made shift to wish him the blessed novelty of a long day's good luck and a limitless larder the morrow. Chapter 6 the division superintendent, the conductor, the driver, 150 miles drive without sleep, teaching a subordinate, our old friend Jack and a pilgrim, Ben Holiday compared to Moses. Our new conductor, just shipped, had been without sleep for 20 hours. Such a thing was very frequent. From St. Joseph, Missouri, to Sacramento, California by stagecoach was nearly 1,900 miles, and the trip was often made in 15 days. The cars do it in four and a half now. But the time specified in the mail contracts and required by the schedule was 18 or 19 days, if I remember rightly. This was to make fair allowance for winter storms and snows and other unavoidable causes of detention. The stage company had everything under strict discipline and good system. Over each 250 miles of road, they placed an agent or superintendent and invested him with great authority. His beat or jurisdiction of 250 miles was called a division. He purchased horses, mules, harnesses, and food for men and beasts and distributed these things among his stage stations from time to time according to his judgment of what each station needed. He erected station buildings and dug wells. He attended to the paying of the station keepers, hostlers, drivers, and blacksmiths, and discharged them whenever he chose. He was a very, very great man in his division, a kind of grand mogul, a sultan of the Indies, in whose presence common men were modest of speech and manner, and in the glare of whose greatness even the dazzling stage driver dwindled to a penny dip. There were about eight of these kings, all told, on the overland route. Next in rank and importance to the division agent came the conductor. His beat was the same length as the agent's, 250 miles. He sat with the driver and, when necessary, rode that fearful distance night and day without other rest or sleep than what he could get perched thus on top of the flying vehicle. Think of it. He had absolute charge of the mails, express matter, passengers, and stagecoach until he delivered them to the next conductor and got his receipt for them. Consequently, he had to be a man of intelligence, decision, and considerable executive ability. He was usually a quiet, pleasant man who attended closely to his duties and was a good deal of a gentleman. It was not absolutely necessary that the division agent should be a gentleman, and occasionally he wasn't. But he was always a general in administrative ability and a bulldog in courage and determination. Otherwise, the chieftainship over the lawless underlings of the overland service would never in any instance have been in him anything but an equivalent for a month of insolence and distress and a bullet and a coffin at the end of it. There were about 16 or 18 conductors on the overland, for there was a daily stage each way and a conductor on every stage. Next in real and official rank and importance after the conductor came my delight, the driver. Next in real but not in apparent importance, importance for we have seen that in the eyes of the common herd, the driver was to the conductor 
as an admiral is to the captain of the flagship. The driver's beat was pretty long, and his sleeping time at the station was pretty short, sometimes. And so, but for the grandeur of his position, he would have been a sor his would have been a sorry life, as well as a hard and a wearing one. We took a new driver every day or every night, for they drove backward and forward over the same piece of road all the time. And therefore, we never got as well acquainted with them as we did with the conductors. And besides, they would have been above being familiar with such rubbish as passengers, anyhow, as a general thing. Still, we were always eager to get a sight of each and every new driver as soon as the watch changed. For each and every day, we were either anxious to get rid of an unpleasant one, or loath to part with a driver we had learned to like, and had come to be sociable and friendly with. And so, the first question we asked the conductor, whatever we got to where we were to exchange drivers, was always, which is him? The grammar was faulty, baby, but we could not know then that it would go into a book someday. As long as everything went smoothly, the overland driver was well enough situated. But if a fellow, dri fellow driver got sick suddenly, it made trouble, for the coach must go on. And so the po potentate who was about to climb down and take a luxurious rest after his long night's siege in the midst of wind and rain and darkness had to stay where he was and do the sick man's work. Once in the Rocky Mountains, when I found a driver sound asleep on the box and the mules going at the usual breakneck pace, the conductor said, never mind him, there was no danger, and he was doing double duty, had driven 75 miles on one couch on one Daddy, coach. Jeopardy's coming on. Okay. Well, it's, it's too many. And was now going back over it on this without rest or sleep. 150 miles of holding back of six vindictive mules and keeping them from climbing the trees. It sounds incredible, but I remember the statement well enough. The station keepers, hostlers, etc., were low, rough characters as already described, and from western Nebraska to Nevada, a considerable sprinkling of them might be fairly set down as outlaws, fugitives, fugitives from justice, criminals whose best security was a section of country which was without law and without even the pretense of it. When the division agent issued an order to one of these parties, he did it, with a full understanding that he might have to enforce it with a Navy six-shooter and so he always went fixed to make things go along smoothly. Now and then a division agent was really a 